Welcome everybody, uh, my name is Wade Nomura and welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. Today we're going to take a look at uh, the Tamal Interpretive Play Area. It's a playground that was developed in Carpinteria with quite a few people and resources to help us out. With me today I have Matt Roberts. Uh, Matt, welcome. Thank you, Wade. And uh, you are the, give me your actual title for I've been working for the last uh, several years as the City of Carpinteria's Parks and Recreation Director. Okay, and you were involved with this playground from the very beginning, pretty much, correct? It was a very interesting project. Originally, the president of the Carpinteria Morning Rotary contacted us and said they wanted to put a playground in the downtown and wanted to do it in the Linden Field, which is a part of the Carpinteria State Beach. Uh huh. And uh, let's see, those people were actually friends of mine uh, with our club. Steve Crawford, who was the president, our second president, also, Jim Heth, a uh, member of our club, his vision was to create a playground very similar to what one they built in Arlington, Texas, um, and that was the vision for that. The other person involved with the uh, planning of that was my wife, Roxanne, so the four of us, I guess, approached you at one time. This is way back in 2003. That's right. So, um, let's see, when you saw the project, what did you actually think of that? Well, when I first heard the idea was to put it in the Carpentry State Beach, I thought, oh boy, because I know that the State Beach doesn't have a playground program. And I tried to steer that kind of effort toward one of our old playgrounds in uh, a city park that needed to be rehabilitated. But there was a vision for it to be downtown, somewhere near the beach, and that was what was stuck to. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Now, I do remember um, fundraising for that first part. The original playground was to be a $128,000 project from a company from New York that was going to build a structure there similar to Kids World. Did you get to see that design, by the way? I did. I remember we had that design charrette at the school mm -hmm. and had a lot of children involved and mm -hmm. in talking about what they would like to see in a new park and a new playground. Got a lot of great ideas. And uh, that was developed for, for a little while, but we had to get the state beach personnel to come along with the idea. <laughs> and that person was uh, Rich Rojas, who we hope to have here today, but he was pretty busy. Um, now, did you meet with Rich on the very first uh, meeting to talk to him and discuss the project? We did, of course we did, and uh, Rich w w should get a lot of credit for this because if you consider the whole state of California's park system, they don't build playgrounds. And Rich said, well, you know, this piece of property you have your eyes on technically is not within the boundaries of the Carpentry State Beach. It's a piece of state-owned property just adjacent to the boundaries. And he thought maybe there was a loophole that would allow us to pursue a path to consider this playground. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I believe they said it was it fell outside of the general plan and scope of the play uh, the parks itself. Now, um, the design that we have currently put in place. Do you know where that came from and how that was developed? I do. I think um, I, as the ideas came forth from the community about what the theme of the park could be, a railroad theme was first considered because the site is right next to the railroad. And Carpentry did have a love of the old train station that used to be there on Linden Avenue. The state, however, thought it would be better if there could be a cultural interpretation. Somebody nominated the idea of the legend of the Rainbow Bridge, which is a Chumash story about uh, Chumash being on Santa Cruz Island, wanting to come back to Carpinteria. Uh, their uh, um, deity made them a bridge of a rainbow. Those who happened to fall off that rainbow turned into dolphins. So it's a very quaint, very friendly story, and that became the theme for the park. So the, hence the name, and the Rainbow Bridge was part of the major, I would say, structure within that park itself. The um, plans itself, uh, they were done by a uh, landscape architect, Barney Matsumoto, I believe, from the state parks. Do you know when he was brought on board to start working with that project? I do. It was very original. Um, when the idea was accepted to explore for the legend of the Rainbow Bridge, Barney was the first one to take a crack at it, and he provided an, a footprint of a park that had certain design and interpretive elements in it that um, was accepted as the vision. And then we hired, <coughs> excuse me, we hired a local landscape architect firm to give us more construction details. Uh, that was Veneta Associates. It was a gentleman uh, who was the lead there, uh, Guillermo Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And he did a gr great job along with Barney, um, produced a construction set of plans that we went through the whole permit process to get. And it was a challenging permit process, but ultimately we ended up with what you see out there today. That's great. Um, now we talk about the plans and the time. Do you remember offhand how long that took? Well, yes, it did. From the very time the park was conceived to the time it was delivered to the public, I think 
And Wade, you were so involved, you'll <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was seven years. Uh, seven years, almost eight years. Because um, it started in 2003, and there's actually a picture that we have of the groundbreaking, uh, that groundbreaking ceremony, which was September 7th of 2010. Um, there's a picture there that uh, hopefully the uh, audience could see. Uh, in that picture, I got a picture of you there, Matt. Uh, Jim Heth, who was one of the uh, in instrumental people in bringing it forward in Rotary. Steve Crawford, uh, myself, my wife, Roxanne. Um, Wes Chapin, who was um, part of the state parks. He was a ranger mm -hmm. there. And uh, we also have, uh, at that time, um, Brad Stein, who was, a, who was the mayor. That was, uh, with the picture, uh, quite a change and a, a vision that I would say was focused on well by the designers itself. How much input did you put into that, that design? Well, I was pretty much involved in a lot of the details. Um, that was the challenge that I was presented with. Here's a two-dimensional drawing of a park that has things like dolphins, a tomol canoe, a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, which served as the, you know, the rainbow bridge, trails, uh, native plantings. Um, and it was my job to figure out how to actually physically come up with all those materials in a way that had quality, but also were affordable, um, and uh, build things such as apps, which are Shumash homes, um, the uh, inventory of sculptures, including a bald eagle on Anacapa Island, the arch rock, which yeah, is right. also uh, represented in the park, uh -huh. harbor seals and sea lions and dolphins. All of that stuff was uh, a challenge to produce. Now we have another uh, picture that shows the actual construction area, the site that's been cleared off. And it looks like they're building the retaining wall um, that was going to hold the soil in place for the climbing structures, things like that, and to create um, the mainland, the island, those themes. Tell us a little bit about that wall. It's pretty unique. Well, we needed to create topography in the park because obviously the idea of uh, an island and the Santa Barbara Channel and then the mainland Carpinteria of Foothills, in order to do that and stay off of the railroad property, we needed a retaining wall. That wall could have been a, just a big square, but it dawned on us that we should make it mimic the silhouette of Santa Cruz Island. <laughs> and that, I think, added another little interpretive element to the park. That is, uh, it's a great idea, a good vision. And also, I believe it helps retain some of the view quarters from the, uh, the neighbors, which that, uh, that's another good point. some issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a few concerns that the park was going to block some views of the ocean, and nobody wants to do that. So. Uh, the valleys in the island profile allowed for us to keep some views open. <laughs> now, you and I worked together on trying to create the retaining portion of, above the wall. Um, that was done in square galvanized tubing. Mm -hmm. um, pretty unique design. Uh, it, it seems to me that that was also to retain, I would say, view quarters, um, that visual visibility, and also to create um, a, a softening effect. Yeah, and there, you know, there's a big challenge in the proximity to the railroad because it's, that's a dangerous place. Yeah. In fact, one of the nice uh, features of the whole project was we also installed a trail from Palm to Linden Avenue, right. and that got people from uh, using the railroad tracks as a de facto trail. But we wanted to make sure that the park and the railroad had a very robust separation. So the thing you're talking about, the fence, a no-climb fence made out of square tubing, um, also with its silver color, it's sort of intended to mimic a fog bank or, or mm -hmm. some fog over the islands right, on, a, right. on a morning. So Which it does, does, does a great job of that. Um, the no glare factor on the shade side, shadow side too, um, remarkable, good effect there. The work of actually having to put those in place, I believe we designed it with a bolt system to hold each one of those individually. There are what, 720 of those, something like that? Yeah, there was times when I was also the construction manager for the project, <laughs> and there were times I didn't want to be there when they were drilling those 1,400 holes. <laughs> True, good point. Um, credit to the city, though. The city employees were actually the ones that did most of the work there for us. Um, there was some volunteers from the Public Works Department yeah. to drill some of the holes uh, in all of the little pickets. The actual contractors for the park drilled all the holes in the concrete, okay. and they matched up miraculous, mir miraculously. And, uh, so far, we've only had to replace one or two of them. They get bent occasionally. Sure. And the whole idea was that we could individually replace them as needed. So yeah. we have a lot of spare parts in case that happens. <laughs> That's good. That is great. You talked about the uh, walkway, the pathway that goes from uh, Palm to Linden. Mm -hmm. um, that became what we've seen in Carpinteria, actually, as a major artery as far as the campers from the state parks. Um, was that part of the plan, part of the idea for the, 
that was going to incorporate and integrate the playground to that? Absolutely. The idea was that we needed to make a better connection for the campgrounds to the downtown because the, a lot of the folks visiting want to get into the downtown. But the only real intuitive route was down the railroad, which is a trespass, and it's unsafe. Sure. This trail um, had some challenges, however, because on that side there's drainage that goes under the railroad and there's a wetland in there. In fact, it was a three jurisdictional wetland. We have the Army Corps of Engineers, the Coastal Commission, and the Regional Water Quality Control Board all wanted to permit that. <laughs> so uh, we had to go through a lot of hoops. That was part of the reason for the timeliness of the project, taking so long to deliver. But in the end, what we have is a boardwalk, about a 300 foot long boardwalk that goes over a, a area that's flooded in the winter. And that acts as a bioswale to help remediate the water that might come from urban runoff before it travels through another storm drain and makes its way down to the Carpenter Salt Marsh Nature Park. Got it. So the, all the regulatory agencies actually ended up being a little skeptical at first, but by the end <laughs> of the story, they were very, very much in favor of it. So that actually became part of the integrated plan overall of that, that area specific. Oh, that's great. Um, we've got another picture here showing some of the features uh, in construction. And on that one, you actually show the um, Anacapa Arch. Now, was that a custom-made piece, or was that something that you found in a catalog? No, every sculpture down in the park is custom-made. Wow. That was a fun part of the project. That is great. They, uh, we, we worked with a couple of different manufacturers. Mostly it was landscape structures who provided about 80% of the uh, of sculptures in the park. And we would describe to them as best we could verbally what we wanted. They would have artists come up with some renditions and we'd approve them or adjust them. Then they would take it to their art studio, just like uh, you might expect Walt Disney to do down on some of the special effects they have and they would create uh, scale models of them, which we would approve or adjust, and ultimately we'd go to full-size production. And that time was another 12 months of working with that vendor to get to an end product. Hmm. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> now, um, one of the other pictures following up on that one, we have a picture of the story tree in the center of uh, an amphitheater, uh, along with the, the rainbow bridge in the background. Tell us a little bit about that story tree, how that became one of the features of the park. That's a great story. And it really is one of the things that makes the park special. The, um, as you may know, Carpinteria was named by Gaspar Portola, who came through Carpinteria uh, as an explorer in about 1769. And he saw the Chumash making their plank canoes on the beach using the tar that comes out as a natural uh, seep on the beach as the caulk to seal the seams of the canoes. And he named Carpinteria Carpinteria, which is a Spanish word for carpenter shop. It's thought that there's a tree in Carpinteria Creek called the Portola Sycamore that was alive when he came 300 and some odd years ago. So we took cuttings from that tree, <coughs> excuse me, and rooted them uh, to create new trees. And one of those trees is the story tree in the park. So there's reason to believe that tree was alive when Carpinteria was named Carpinteria wow. and the Chumash were in, in part of their zenith of their culture. Um, and it's a way to carry that spirit and that culture and that um, love of the past into the park. That is pretty neat. That's a great story. Um, now we have also the um, bridge in the background. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, the bridge is the rainbow bridge. Um, we try to keep the deck of it painted in rainbow colors, but the use of the park is so great that those colors fade. Um, but we did take some leaves from the actual the, the parent tree and we pressed them. My daughter, Claire Ann, was involved. I had her help <laughs> nice. me as a volunteer. And we uh, pressed those leaves, and then we troweled them into the concrete deck of the bridge. So when you walk across the Rainbow Bridge and you see sycamore leaves, those are actually from a tree that's 300 and some odd years old that maybe Gaspar Portola actually laid his eyes on. <laughs> nice. And I noticed they called it the Rainbow Bridge, and I think you're pretty clever in actually getting the rainbow theme on that. Could you tell us how you did that? Because uh, one of the issues was, we didn't want to have a rainbow bridge showing the rainbow colors. <laughs> uh, you know, that was a struggle. I thought, boy, that's going to be um, maybe controversial in the downtown. <laughs> and I, I want to go back just a second because that was one of the um, stress points of this project. I've done a, several parks in Carpentry and several trail projects and some ball fields and some other small park amenities. But this is in the downtown and it had to be done with a high quality. The idea of expressing the rainbow bridge at first thought was, well, we'll just paint the rails in rainbow colors. And I really worried about how that was going to come out. The pro park project had to go through all the review boards, like the architectural review board. <laughs> now, were you on the? Yes, I was <laughs> yeah, at the time. So you were one you. of the reviewers. 
Um, maybe you uh, sequestered yourself. I, I, I had know. to. I was actually part of the presentation <laughs> um, program. So the solution was not to put it on the uh, vertical surfaces, but the horizontal ones. So the deck itself is where the rainbow is expressed. Mm, nice. Now, uh, what else is interesting is part of the, um, I say, the theme of the park is that the bridge connects up two bodies. Um, one is the mainland, and then the other side is one of the islands, correct? That's representative of Santa Cruz Island. Okay. <laughs> That's in keeping with the story. And uh, one of the reasons why that actually occurred in the construction itself uh, with the walk walkway and trail going up had to do with ADA compliance, correct? Another challenge in the park yeah. was that the state and, you know, state law also, pre but the state was, state of California Parks Department was very, very, um, um, you know, serious and very, very interested in that ramp being ADA compliant. And the best way we could do that is to keep it um, in some places under 5% of a grade and other places under 8 and a third percent of a grade. And we had to reject the contractor's work a couple of times because they missed it by just a little bit. It was a challenging circular spiral trail that had to meet um, ADA requirements. Now the contractor, I would like to bring him up because uh, that company was very helpful in, in creating um, our vision. His name was uh, Peter Lapidus. And uh, any comment on him? I know he was great to work with at our end of it. He is a good guy because he's a good problem solver. This park had a lot of little details. Um, in fact, every day we were puzzling over how to solve that problem or that problem. And at the end, I think it met all of our expectations. Great. Tell us a little bit about the plants because the plants are also <coughs> shown in that picture, some of the uh, selection of plant materials. Well, we tried to pick a lot of plants that were culturally significant um, to the Chumash Indians. So you'll see things like the California native rose and they use the hips to make tea. Yerba Mansa is another plant that's out there that uh, was used medicinally by the uh, Shumash. Um, the Toyones, uh, some of the grasses, a lot of these native plants um, were then also represented in an interpretive panel, which is just adjacent to the park, explaining how they were used uh, in the old days. So it's, um, even the plantings are significant to the story and in keeping with the theme. Great. And you also have the Junctus that was used for Thank you. That's a good one. That's yeah. also out there. The yeah, junk, Junkus textilis, I think. Correct. For basket weaving, making right. containers. Yeah. And it's interesting to note that Carbon Rear has always had the tar seeps, and in fact, that asphaltum product was used to line baskets to make them watertight, so you could carry them as vessels. There's a um, picture that we're showing with uh, the park, with with one of the apps in the foreground, some of the uh, concrete structures, and it looks like a. Um, Looks like water. Um, what, what was that that was used for that area? Well, we used two different materials. We used uh, glass jelly beans. A lot of recycled glass is available through companies, Specialty Glass. I think it's out of Southern California. Um, we've identified a, a jelly bean glass that we were able to trowel in, what you might call a seeded aggregate, into some of the walkways. And others, we used a concrete stain that's blue. Okay. Um, we were going to try to make blue concrete, and we found out the mineral that's required to make Concrete blue is very rare and consequently very cost prohibitive. Okay. Um, some of the other areas, um, looks like a fall area that you have. That looks pretty interesting too. That's not concrete, is it, or glass? That's right. This is a playground. So it has <laughs> okay. to meet all of the standards for uh, playground safety. And uh, we use two different materials to make that. The blue part is a pour in place rubber, and it's a, a very colorful material. It's um, real pricey per square foot. But we show a tomal canoe kind of half on the water and half on the beach and thought it would be great to use the wood chips which emulate a sandy beach. So we sort of have another design element in there where even in the fall area, um, the blue pour in place rubber for uh, the ocean and the wood chips for the beach. Great, um, let's see, what else we have? Uh, the concrete structures, most of them are, it looks to be climbing structures, is that correct? Are they made for kid safety? The apps, as they're called, the Shumash uh -huh. homes. Yeah, those are the, one of them is a climbing structure, believe it or not, and the other two are just considered uh, uh, playground elements, but they're all within the fall area. Okay. And the ones that have more of a thatch roof are, are not the ones that are supposed to be climbed on or, or weren't designed to be climbed on. Kids climb on them nevertheless. Sure. And uh, that's one of the real joys of the project is just about any weekend, there are a tremendous number of kids having the greatest time. I think one of the elements that surprised me the most was the little slide that's got the rollers. <laughs> right. I can tell you it was funny I, when I was dying to <laughs> try that out and they didn't have the fall area installed yet. And I got up there and I came down that slide 
And I found out why you need a fall area, because it hurts <laughs> when you hit the ground. I, I, I did hear that story, <laughs> Matt. I guess you're famous. You got the lo longest lurch out of that thing. I heard you landed six feet away. At least, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, the structures that you selected, uh, for example, the slide, um, some of the other slides we have there and structures on that slope, because the slope was limited, mm -hmm. is that one of the reasons why you selected those specific items? It was, because this roller slide will perform on a very gradual incline. So we were trying to, these are kind of berm mounted slides rather than freestanding slides. And in that area, the roller one just fit it to a T. I didn't think I was even gonna find one. I remember seeing one for the first time up in Monterey where they have one at the Dennis the Menace Park, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, that probably has not made anymore because somebody probably hurt themselves a long time ago. <laughs> but lo and behold, there it was in one of the slide catalogs. So we went with it. That's good. Um, also, uh, with the apps, uh, as one of the examples of uh, safety, children's safety, I noticed that they're raised up so you could see around and underneath them. That's right. Okay. Um, I believe also in the design, we designed it to where parents could see just about the whole park from s specific sitting areas. Exactly right. One of the things that we do in park design is to try and have good observation all around. So if you're uh, walking, for instance, across the Tomo um, area, you'll be able to see through the park. If you're up on the Rainbow Bridge, you can observe all through the park. Uh, these are good ways to help uh, keep parents in touch with their children visually mm -hmm. and also just good safety design. Um, one of the other pictures we have is a picture actually of the Tamol. Um, could you tell us how that was developed and designed? Did you have a part of that? Well, we did go up and look very closely at known examples of the Tamol, and the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum has one in their auditorium as an example. Uh, we did consult with some Shumas folks about the things to put on in terms of symbolism uh, and went through that process where with a, uh, a sketch and some photographs sent it to the creative art studio that was going to manufacture it and they did a wonderful job. They did a it's beautiful one of the job most, of it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really fun. If you go to this park and you walk around and you look carefully, there's a big picture and you see the park, but if you look at detail, there's a lot of detail in just about every element of it that is a way for kids and adults to just continue to discover things there, even if they've visited many times. Now, the park itself, uh, originally I said it started out as a $128,000 project. I think by the time we were completed with that, it ended up close to a million dollars. So, so much for that budget. But um, I, I know when we developed it, you, myself, and, and Rich talked about it, that we wanted to create a partnership within this community. Uh, the community itself of Carpinteria, the Rotarians, uh, the city of Carpinteria, and also the state parks of California. And in part of that, it had to do with funding it. Could you tell us how that broke down? Don't need to know the dollar amount, but how the participation came. Was yeah. it equal? Was it well received? Well, you know, that's one of the parts of this project that is probably most profound. And the amount of collaboration that occurred between uh, Morning Rotary, between California State Parks, between the city of Carpinteria, and even just the, everybody in the community who had a chance to contribute either a little volunteerism or a, a little financial help, um, that is what made it happen. A lot of common interest and a lot of, a lot of visioning that everybody could agree on. Um, the uh, fact that we had such a good joint um, project uh, is really a springboard for future cooperation among us. And, um, especially with the footprint that Carpinteria State Beach has in the city of Carpinteria, um, this just serves as an example of what we can do when we work together. True, very true. The name, Tabal Interpretive Play Area. It's not called a playground, it's called a play area, and it's interpretive. Could you tell us where that name came about? Well, we talked about that a little bit earlier, how the state doesn't have playgrounds, and they still don't have one, <laughs> but they will have an interpretive play area. <laughs> so they wouldn't let us call it a playground. And, uh, they felt that that would be inconsistent with how uh, they operate. So uh, they, at the same time, and this reminds me that this is the only example that was in place when this was completed, this was seen as a experiment with them. Um, there was no other new playground anywhere in the state of California in a state park. So this uh, actually might steer the way toward uh, other examples in the future for them to implement. So we're kind of proud of that. That's a pretty neat thing to be the cutting edge uh, with neat, yeah. that department. And the items, all of the elements of the park itself are specific to uh, historical facts. In other words, this was all part of Carpentry's history and heritage. That's right, I think it fits really well in the downtown. I w again, I was very concerned that, boy, if this doesn't go well or it doesn't look <laughs> right, 
but the acceptance and uh, the appreciation of it was universal just right out of the box. Um, everybody loves it. And the uh, element that it adds to the downtown just for families to enjoy um, is uh, really now I realize it was much more of a need than I thought. So back to the original people who conceived this at, in Rotary who um, wanted this to happen, they were, they were right. <laughs> this was an excellent project. Great. Um, I understand too that there, this is actually being used as a model, uh, not only in state, well, in state parks, but also nationally in other areas, specific because of the success of this. Have you seen any or heard of any? Uh, it was impressive to me when the Landscape Structures Catalog came out the next year. They had a full spread feature on this park. <laughs> oh, is <laughs> so, that right? Yes, it was in the middle of their catalog. It's an <laughs> example of what they can do. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so that was an endorsement, I think. <laughs> and I believe also one thing unique about this park, uh, even though it is a, a playground type, is that there are multi-generation of people using it. In other words, you have parents, grandparents, kids of all ages actually enjoying this park. Uh, I think that was one of the successes also of it locally. Do you have any idea how many people actually use the park? No, you know we don't. Um, I know that if I walk by on a typical day, especially a weekend, I'll see dozens and dozens of people in there. It's way more used than any of the other playgrounds that we have in Carpinteria. Um, it might be that proximate location. It is on an irresistible trail connection between the campground and the downtown. Uh, so it actually serves not only as a park project that doesn't um, has some cultural appreciation and interpretation, it has a stormwater benefit quality with the bioswale that feeds the salt marsh park. It has a rail safety benefit because it gets people off the railroad and sure. now they have a much safer trail to use. Um, it also has an economic uh, vitality element because it's connecting a lot of uh, tourists to our little downtown business district. All of those things combined uh, make it a big winner. And the uh, last picture we have is a picture of the, of the uh, sidewalk itself uh, having his bridge, uh, bricks actually used for uh, acknowledgments. I believe that is the fundraising component of that, how that's used. Well, uh, Matt, I'd like to thank you for your time there and effort. Uh, I know it was a long project. Uh, originally started uh, 2003 and uh, 2010 was the groundbreaking. It was the following year that we actually opened it up and it's been very successful. Everybody talks about it. I've seen people come on the trains for that. So uh, once again, thank you for that. You did well, an thanks. outstanding job and it's been great partnering with you. Yeah, thank you for Rotary for taking it on as a sponsorship our, project. Our pleasure. Well, thank you everybody for joining us on uh, the Tamal Interpretive Play Area show. I, I'd like you all, if you have a chance, swing on by, take a look at that and enjoy it yourself. It was one of those great projects that we've done and we've really enjoyed it. Matt and myself and most of the other people involved take a lot of pride in how that came out. Thank you everybody, we'll see you soon.